um, hopefully. Yep, How's you're good, that? Hello. Yep, you're good. Yes. You're away. Okay. Excellent. So I was, um, I try and every time we do one of these workshops to have a new and interesting photo um, for our cover page. So I thought this time um, the absolute deserted um, Lake Terrace with I think one car there um, was pretty relevant to the current situation and um, in the context of the district plan review thinking about um, that as a tool as we move forward in this kind of completely unknown um, economy that we're going to be stepping back into and I guess we're trying to still just working out or everyone's still just working out aren't we about what that's going to mean but I think probably the key for the district plan is to be um, flexible um, and kind of allow for, allow for the uncertainty if you like um, as we move forward so just in terms of um, today's um, agenda just a little bit of a progress update um, on where we're, what we've been doing and where we're, where we're at. Um, our, um, as I've just sort of touched on really, how, how this review is going to fit in this current climate and things we just might need to be aware of moving forward. Um, EWI obligations, which has been a big, um, a big proportion of our workload um, really at the moment um, and trying to get that um, sorted. So we'll have a bit of a um, talk about that. And then Cara will take over um, to talk about natural values because we've got quite a bit of um, technical work which has been done in that respect. And so we're kind of ready to get on with the next steps there. Um, just a reminder, um, it's been a while since we've um, talked to you. Um, and I think the last time we actually did talk to you was um, just after um, the election and was basically um, a what is the district plan and, and um, what are we doing with it. So um, any time you want to um, have a check on our district plan and what it means for different parts of the um, total district, you can jump on the ISA plan. Um, we're one of the um, few um, councils actually with our plan already up and running as an e-plan. Um, a lot of councils um, are having to now um, jump into that space because um, the new planning standards which came in um, earlier this year um, in April um, they said that if you don't have an e-plan you basically need to have an e-plan so tick, we've done that so that's good um, and that's the address there or you can just find it via our website um, if you want to have a little bit of a nosy around it. Now, apologies, I was supposed to be jumping in there to remove that highlight um, <laughs> before you got here because my objective was going so slowly, um, I couldn't get in there. So um, just in terms of a progress um, review, as I said, um, our iwi obligations have been um, taking up quite a lot of time. And, um, and I guess sometimes I guess it can kind of be frustrating that, that it is taking so much time, but I guess the emphasis here is that this is really important to get right and it will um, save us um, a lot of time in the long run um, if we get these relationships and set up these um, the working relationships right at the start. Um, it's a little bit tricky because for, for a couple of reasons we've got multiple iwi partners who I'll run through in a minute, um, but we've also got different obligations to each of those partners, depending on different pieces of legislation. So under the RMA, all our EWI partners have an elevated um, status. So we need to work through, work with them um, right throughout the district plan review. And um, we, we have to go to the extent where we're building capacity within our EWI partners to be able to respond back to the district plan review. And I think we've talked to you um, a little bit about um, some funding um, that we have already got in place to um, get a consultant or two who will act as a conduit basically between our EWI partners and us and help support them to be able to provide um, feedback and input into the district plan review. So we have to work with um, 
all our WeWe partners under the RMA in that respect. Then with three of our WeWe partners who are initially Tarot and Rokawa, we have um, JMAs in place um, and JMAs are joint management agreements, just so I'm not talking in too much jargon. Um, also, 240 Toa have initiated a JMA, so they haven't got one in place yet, but um, that's in process. And so while you're in the development process, you essentially have to treat them as a JMA partner. So with them, we need to form, with our JMA partners, we need to leave formally commence the review um, with support from our JMA partners. It's a little bit sort of funny because we have to do our um, RMA, uh, sorry, our district plan review anyway, because the RMA says we have to because our plan is mostly 10 years old. Um, but we still need to go through the process under the JMAs where we get a recommendation from those JMA partners to formally commence the district plan review. Now it sounds a bit odd because we've been working away on this district plan review for what seems like forever already, but um, it's kind of just a formal process that we need to go through. We are bringing an item to you um, at the next council meeting on the 26th um, to get that um, formal commencement. Um, at this stage, we have two of the three um, um, JMA partners who have provided written support, and we are very, very hopeful that we can get um, Rokawa on board um, prior to that meeting on the 26th of May. Um, so that'll come through in your agenda packs very soon. Um, so while we've been doing all that, and, and I guess um, I guess I just wanted to run through that because just to explain why that's, that sort of seems to have taken so long, just because we've got those sort of quite technical and complex sort of relationships and obligations under different pieces of legislation that we need to make sure we get right. And so that's why um, we seem to be a bit slow. But in the meantime, we've got um, a whole lot of technical and background work, which has been continuing from our home offices all around the district, um, especially on rural hazards, natural values, the district wide section and the Tenawa section. Um, we've been starting to have a little bit of a think about consulting with our community on these sections of the plan and how they're going to feel about that right now. Um, just being very aware that some people, it just may not be a priority at all. They will have other things to think about, businesses that they'll be thinking about getting back up, up and running. So district plan may not even be a priority. But on the other hand, there'll be other people who may be wanting to do stuff and get stuff done without there being unnecessary um, red tape in the way. So we kind of have to kind of manage that bit of a bit of a, bit of a balance um, as we um, go through. I'll just pause there, see if there's any questions before I continue blabbering on. Any questions for Hillary? Yeah. Uh, John Williamson here, Hillary. Just with the um, Hi, Hi, Hillary. With the strategic direction, uh, going back to June, we there was the um, section of management of urban growth and management of location of, of commercial activities. Is that for not for that obviously is that technical background work completed or given that COVID nineteen was impacted whether you did suggest they would have to be flexible but organic, so I guess that um, will be taken into consideration. Yeah, so basically what happened is, um, and um, this, this kind of went in between the crossover of um, the different councils, but back in um, June last year, we held a meeting with all our WeWe partners together in one room. And um, at that stage, we were <clears throat> keen as mustard to get um, things um, up and running yeah, as fast as possible. And we were working on multiple sections of the plan, just as, like you say, the strategic um, strategic section of the plan. So <clears throat> we were working away on that. But we at that meeting where we had all our WeWe partners, um, we got a very strong signal just to hold fire and get these working relationships in place, commence under the JMAs, and um, get our working relationships and figure out how we were going to work with our iwi partners through the review um, first before we started going out and consulting and so on with the rest of the community. So that's kind of what um, has has sort of put things on hold, I guess, or slowed things down. Um, 
over the past nine months or so. Then of course COVID came along and added to that complication. Um, so essentially with sections like this, um, the strategic section, it's all there sitting ready to go, but we're really at a place with that section, for example, where we're ready to test that with um, the community and different um, key stakeholders. But until we've actually formalized this commencement with our JMA partners, partners and established um, how we're gonna work with them, which is also in process as well and, and very close, um, we, we felt it wouldn't be appropriate for us to be bowling off and talking to other parts of the community before we'd um, got those sections, they got those um, issues sorted out. So they basically just kind of held up um, until we were ready again to start um, talking to the community. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mike, thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Hilary. If you carry on, thanks. So I've already kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, we are obviously just going to have to sort of tread carefully as we um, as we carry on. Um, like I sort of mentioned, um, I think there's going to be two ends of the spectrum when we start talking about the district plan review. Some parts of the community who will just have other priorities, but other other parts who are keen for um, the economy to be stimulated and reduce red tape. It's going to be really interesting to see what. Um, what the development sector is like and the pressure there. As you'll um, be well aware, um, a couple of our pressure point areas were rural lifestyle um, and industrial land. So both those two areas were identified as sort of areas where we needed to look um, more closely at whether we should be supplying some more land for those activities. Um, I guess, I don't know, I don't know if it's a question we can answer right now, but that's something we're going to just have to um, test out, I guess, um, once we get back into level two and, and hopefully level one beyond that and see what starts happening out um, in the um, economy. But I guess um, for us, the advice that we've had so far from, our, from some of the experts that provide us um, advice in these areas is that the, the, our base information is really important. So having a really good picture about what um, what activity we had going on prior to um, COVID and how much land we had available and um, the rate of um, development of that land and so on. That's um, the best position that we can be in is to make sure that we've got all that information up to scratch, which we have, and we've been um, getting, getting that information already so that we can move forward. And like I guess um, we mentioned before, be flexible, um, with how we are reacting to different issues that pop up um, that we might not even know exist yet. David, just could I just uh, David, could I just ask yep. a question? You're referring back to uh, to rural, and I attended a couple of meetings with yourself and others. We just last week, I think, what's well, got that uh, property economics paper out? Is that the sort of background you're talking about? Because there's some interesting comments made through that. Yes. So basically, I guess. Um, they, they almost come down to supply and demand type um, questions and answers. So um, we've got X amount of land and our demand over the past 10 years has been X. Um, so, so we know we've got a really good picture of our supply and we've got a really good picture of the demand that we had prior to COVID. I guess the question is going to be, what does the environment look like? after COVID and how does that affect our demand on rural lifestyle? Um, that's a question that I don't know we haven't answered yet. Yeah. But I think it was interesting, Harry, when I looked at page 17, it talked about uh, retire, retiree demand diminishes. Um, we'll always have retirees. So I don't think that's an area that will diminish, but yeah, there also there's some very interesting points in that particular document as well. Yes, so we'll, um, we had the um, rural on the agenda to talk about at the next workshop um, and we can get into more detail there and Tanya is our um, expert on um, rural issues. Um, but basically what, um, in a nutshell, what that report said was um, that prior to COVID, we um, were short of um, rural lifestyle, which we kind of all knew, um, you know, from um, what we'd heard out and about anyway, but um, so that basically gave us the data to show that um, 
we were about, I think it was about 60, um, and Tanya, if you're there, please feel free to, to jump in and correct my numbers if I'm wrong. Um, we had about 60 um, shortage um, at that point of the, when the paper was wrote, and then looking forward into the um, 10 years beyond that, it was up to about 200. So um, looking at the projections, um, we would need about 200 in the next sort of, oh, sorry, yeah, 200 in the next um, 10 years. Is that right, Tanya, if you're there? Yes, you're absolutely bang on the money. And that's, and that's to do with the latent uh, properties, isn't it? That's right. So there'd be a bit of a catch up on, on um, supply because we were a bit short um, and then also meeting that future demand. Um, so that's you. pretty much what that um, paper came down to. And then obviously there's a bit, quite a bit of work to be done on um, how that gets supplied, where that gets supplied, um, its interaction with um, other activities that are going on and, and making sure that we don't undo the good work that we did um, back in earlier in the 2000s when um, we sh slowed down subdivision of the rural environment so that it wasn't getting carved up all over the show. Did you say that was good work, Hilary, did it, was it? <laughs> <coughs> I think you might find... Oh, sorry, I'll leave that. <laughs> I think, uh, sorry, Kylie. Yep. Conversations that I'm hearing out there is that COVID has certainly given people a bit of a shake up and they're looking for more land to be able to be kind of more um, mm. self-sufficient that they're able to grow food for themselves. So I think that we may see um, a large demand added to that rural property sector. Absolutely, I, I definitely agree with that, Kylie. I don't know if Yvonne's, Yvonne's there. I, I, I would say there's no lack of uh, people scouting around for lifestyle blocks at all. No, she might have gone. Okay, Hilary, thanks, carry on. Yeah, well, we'll, um, we'll have some more detail around that um, at the next workshop and we'll run through um, some of those numbers in more detail um, next time. And um, yeah, and the other thing that might be, you know, we might be getting more information um, from economists and so on around the place about some of those impacts. And, and like you say, um, some of those more um, unusual consequences that are perhaps not quite what you'd expect, but look, you know, the example of, of requiring more land for self-sufficiency and so on, it's kind of um, things that you don't quite expect to come out of, of, a, of a situation like that and making sure that we're, like I said, we're flexible enough to be able to um, incorporate those. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so just, I guess, a little, this is a, just a little bit of a, um, a back, backward step because I know that you are working a lot at the moment on prioritising spending and projects and um, I guess just a little bit of um, a talk around why we're doing this now and the reason for that is because we have to. Um, so the RMA says that um, our plan needs to be reviewed um, when it gets to 10 years. Ours is um, over 10 years or most of it is over 10 years. Um, and so basically under the RMA, we're required to undertake that um, review. So unfortunately, we don't have much choice about that. Um, I guess the question then comes down to how fast you do it. We've been attempting to actually do it reasonably fast. I know it probably doesn't seem fast, but, um, but in terms of district plan reviews, our timeline's actually um, quite optimistic. And the reason for that is because for these complicated reviews, you need lots of evidence and background data. And so if you slow your review down too much and wait too long, then all that data gets too old and then you have to relook at it or, or it becomes um, vulnerable to challenge when you're at court because your data is all five years old, seven years old. Um, so that's why for us, um, our view is that it's, it's most efficient to try and get it done as fast as we can because then all our review, all our information is, is up to date and it's, um, you know, it stands up in court when we get there because we probably will get there. Um, unfortunately, they, district plan reviews are just expensive. Um, we, there are a lot of parts of the plan that we rely on technical experts. Um, for example, at the moment, we've got GNS who are um, looking at um, updating all the fault line mapping around the district. So 
we can't do that in house. It has to be done by those expert experts and basically genius are the only you know people in the country that can do it. So um, and that that sort of um, those experts we we require their input in quite a few aspects of the plan, and um, they need to be there so that when we get to court, then our um, our data is reliable and it's from experts who. Uh, experts in their field. Um, I think I've pretty much covered all that. So I'll just, again, I'll pause just in case there's any questions. Probably, Hilary, I'll jump in here. I think if we can just just hold questions on this one, um, what what council has to do in, in very short order, so in the next little while, is going to be going through our annual plan and prioritising all of our projects. There will be options and, and decisions that you need to make, and I think it's probably wrong and unfair for us to get you to do that. Um, on this project alone, without those other projects in the in the in the in the, in the picture, so um, bear these points in mind. They're, they're valid and they're, they're worthwhile. You're thinking about, but um, I think let's hold that decision and, and those thinkings until uh, until we have the annual plan conversation. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't expecting any um, response to this. I was just um, just putting the putting that out there for you to absorb. Sorry, Hilary, just to interrupt, just remind everyone that um, we're actually live streaming this, so they can please turn their mute on when, um, <laughs> if, um, if you don't mind, it'd be much appreciated. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that at the start. Thanks, Hilary. No problem. Okay, I kind of um, have already covered off a lot, um, quite a bit um, about this, so... This is um, our AWI obligations. And so here are all our AWI partners. Um, so we've got multiple AWI partners and maintaining a relationship with all those AWI partners is really important. Um, and we are working with each of them. And as I mentioned before, we have set up a process where we are looking to fund a consultant who will act as a conduit to help build their capacity and provide advice and help um, provide information in both directions between us and, and from them um, on the district plan review. Um, and you can see the stars there are the RMA, sorry, the JMA partners who um, have those additional um, obligations um, under the RMAs, oh, sorry, the JMAs. So I think I've really covered um, pretty much all these um, points in my previous um, discussion. So does anyone have any questions on, on our um, AWI partners and, and relationships and so on? <laughs> no, thanks, Sally. I, I'm not too sure who it is, but someone someone hasn't got their mute on still. Is uh, Coffee? Councillor Body. Oh, Councillor John, do you mind? It's just... sorted. It's sorted. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Hilary on that? One, um, one point probably to, to bring up is we know that you had quite a few um, sessions with some of our um, EWI partners um, earlier on um, to meet um, and help um, build understanding of where um, different EWI partners are at. We, we think that you're missing one with Rokawa. I think they were unavailable to make um, the dates that um, the last one was held on, so um, we're talking to them at the moment about how um, that can be made to happen, hopefully, once we um, get into a little bit of more normality. This has a lot of synergy with our meeting we had this morning, of course, going forward. Um, absolutely correct, and that is part of the conversation, but um, obviously that's a closed session and, and but this all feeds into that same conversation, Councillor John. Understood. Okay, well, I've, I've um, covered most of this. So as, um, as I said, on the 26th of May, we'll um, bring up that item around the commencement um, under the JMA. So I've already talked about that. So I can give, you can have a rest from my voice and, and hand over to Cara to talk about um, natural values. Thanks, Cara. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to give you a bit of an overview of, of where we're at with um, 
the natural environment um, section of our um, district plan review. Um, so yeah, just feel free to find any questions um, about this, but essentially um, the, the section in our district plan that relates to natural environment is all about the undeveloped areas of our district where nature prevails. So in the context of the Resource Management Act, it's about um, important landscape features, indigenous bush areas, geothermal, um, wetlands, lakes and rivers, and public access to some of those areas. And essentially those are um, low built up areas. There's few buildings or modification. They're dominated by open space and have high scenic qualities. And they're really highly valued for their nature or wilderness experience. And they also strongly contribute to our sense of place and belonging and the basis for a lot of our economy and tourism, power generation, soil conservation for farming and um, contribute to forestry accreditation. Um, and they often have strong cultural connections or narrative associated with them. Thanks, Hilary. So how we identify those areas is we rely on technical studies. And um, at the moment we have wildland consultants who are preparing a mapping the indigenous bush areas or sometimes called significant natural areas or SNAs, um, wetlands and rivers. And um, Boff and Misko are reviewing the landscapes and natural features. And that still requires workshops with our iwi partners. These are desktop studies at this stage. So ground truthing and site visits are still to come. Um, and at the moment, those technical studies are just finishing their mapping. Um, and generating a list of affected landowners uh, with the landscape one still to, to, to have a workshop with our area partners. And we've had some initial discussions with landowners and organisations um, who are affected by these areas. And um, really to let you know that um, soon we'll hopefully be able to um, start getting in contact with, with our affected landowners. Thanks, Hilary. In terms of land ownership of these areas, it's about half of the total district. So we have a really high proportion of natural environment in our district compared to a lot of other um, districts, particularly in the North Island. And they're about half private ownership and half public ownership. So half is in dock estate or state forest park, council reserves. And the other half is privately owned through farmland um, or um, of that um, about 80% is multiply owned Māori land, um, forestry, wetlands and the lakes and rivers including Hopamoana and the Waikato River. Thanks Laurie. So the, the next steps from here is that um, we would like to do some more workshops with, the, with our iwi partners to assist in that landscape identification. And once mapping is complete, we'll start contacting our affected landowners to offer a site visit um, to Ground Truth. And um, with the um, national policy statement for Indigenous biodiversity that the government's putting out, we will have an obligation to, to site visit all those areas and make sure that we've mapped them appropriately. Um, and it's also a really good opportunity to start having initial discussions with our landowners um, to gain their views and values, particularly on our existing landscape um, and natural value areas. Uh, we'll start gathering this information and drafting issues and opportunities reports. So once we've started to talk to our landowners, we can then feed that, um, feed that back to you um, and any issues that particular issues that come up. And then following that, we will begin the process of reviewing our existing objectives and policies and drafting new ones if required. Um, and we may look at putting together an advisory group of organisations that may be affected by this review to test and work through the proposed provisions. Um, but we may just wait and see what comes out of our feedback with discussions with landowners as well. We've already had some good discussions with um, other organisations. Um, 
we will, yeah, of course, be reporting back on that on that progress on proposed policy direction as we go along. So that's really just an update on um, natural values. Um, any, if you've got any queries, feel free to fire through. No, that's cool, Cara. Any questions of Cara? No, all, all pretty straightforward. I suppose when it, um, and it's not really my business, but when it comes to the procurement of these consultants, now that we're post COVID times, is there, you know, um, have they given us sort of contract prices or hourly rates or how does it work? Do we ask for a, do, do we ask for a post COVID price now? <laughs> Not wanting to, um, uh, you know, that's, a, I understand it's an operational thing probably, but, but I ju just put that thought out there that uh, it could be a question that could be asked by the okay. appropriate person at the right time. I guess your worship, rest assured that we're um, currently trying to find every dollar of savings that we can, yeah. literally every dollar of savings yeah. that we can. Um, it's it's sure. quite depressing actually, just how far we're having to, to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we'll get that through to you. And, and we're really conscious that particularly the district plan stuff is highly um, dependent on consultants and out of towners as well. There's very yes. few local dollars coming out of this. So yeah. that's part of that thinking that we're having to do in terms of um, speed of the spend in this in the current environment yeah and dare i say the advent of zoom and all these other yeah. even i know how to work these things now um you know it could be you know, who would know it could be some savings here but no that's cool thank you cara any other questions of cara okay hillary um i was just going to add um i guess um when those when those visits start happening out to those landowners, I guess that's quite a um, a time when you as councillors may start getting queries or questions or comments um, from your contacts out in the community too. So I guess it was just a flag um, from us to say that um, we will be starting to get organised. We're still working that through, obviously, with um, not having no one what um, level we were going to when until yesterday. So. Um, but just a sort of a heads up, I guess, so that you knew that they were um, kind of coming. Um, and we'll we'll keep you updated as I um, put out a little um, newsletter to you recently uh, following um, one of our um, regular meetings that we have on the district plan review, just, just updating you on where we we're at. So we'll keep you um, posted with any dates and, and so on when that's going to start and through that um, avenue. Can we just have some due consideration there that you're actually entering into people's homes and how it would feel if people were popping into your home and wanting to go through things in your house and your place and your space? Um, it is quite invasive for whoever the landowners are. Um, people do love their land in whatever respect that is um, and that it is people's property that is going to be entered. Yes, absolutely. And um, we were, um, you know, when we did this exercise 10 years ago, it was, we were bowled away with how hospitable and um, um, willing landowners were to welcome us onto their land. And, and so we certainly will be very sensitive around that. And we, and it's only where landowners would agree for us to do that as well. Oh. So yeah, thank, thank you for yeah, that yeah, reminder. Good, good, good point um, Kylie even though I think, um, last but, time yeah. last time we did this process um Cara spent untold amount of times on the back of tractors and, and four-wheel drive quad motorbikes and in, um, in farmhouse kitchens having cups of tea she was probably well over tea and, and scones by the end of it but for some really good relationships so yeah whatever we do in the space that's gonna have to continue for sure yeah I, I guess the the public commentary or where, where you get the most commentary is the rural rural you know um environment changes or whatever or proposed or whatever comes up there. I think, Hilary, that would probably be the most vocal one uh, that councillors will get in their ear, like real estate agents, all that sort of thing. So um, from what I can recall last time, it seemed to hijack a lot of the other good stuff that was happening. So, you know, it's how we manage that and how we comms that or comms all that up would be the would be the scenario there. But um, no, that's um It'll be That's that um, protection of, of natural and landscape values, your worship, will be, yes. be a key part, you know, and it's the um, 
you know, balance between um, private property rights, productive land versus um, locking them up for the rest of them, yeah, you know, for the townies, and then then the feel good factor. That's that's yeah. the really hard one. And the other one, last time I think uh, Hillary and Karen might remember, was the um, structures on ridge lines, uh, all that sort of thing. You know, where you get a, a ridge line on uh, on the, you know, you put a woolshed on the top or a house on top or something like that. Uh, I don't know what happened in the end, but um, that was quite a big talking point, as I recall it. <clears throat> but uh, no, all good. So we're basically uh, progressing along. Uh, quite nicely and steadily, um, and um, post COVID, I don't think hopefully there will be too many too many changes, but we'll see. I think the lag period will be about six months, and we'll see what what happens there, I suppose. But any councillors got any other questions of Hillary and Cara or Nick? Oh, um, just just wondering, um, Hillary or, or Cara, is this presentation? Are you able to email this out? I've, I've got a couple of questions, but I can take it offline. Yeah, sure. I think. Um, and within your diligent, um, we have got a little bit of a district plan folder, I believe. Carrie's our expert in that area, so she'll be able to um, check on that. But um, we were planning on uploading basically all this um, so that you've got it all there in one place, all the information on the district plan review in one place. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I did, I did have a nosy just before I asked that question, but I couldn't see it there, but thanks. Yeah, no, I don't think we've um, been organised <laughs> enough to get it through to... Um, through to carry prior to this, so um, but we'll make right. sure we do it afterwards. Thank you. Oh, cool. okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, we will uh, we'll close the workshop there. Um, that is, unless there's anything else to add, but um, we will hopefully catch you up with you and better talk. Well, yeah. A meeting next time or whatever it is. Yeah, maybe face to face next time. Face to even face, if we yeah. maybe even if we're two meters apart. <laughs> yeah. You've just got to bring your own lunch, that's all.